Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today at with 6G World and the 6G Symposium. My name is Diane Ronaldo, and I am the Executive Director of the Open RAN Policy Coalition. We appreciate you joining today to talk about shaping the future with ORAN, interoperability versus zero touch control. ORAN brings together two big ideas, enabling interoperability to create a more vibrant, competitive environment and the ability for artificial intelligence to control the network autonomously in this case through the Radio Access Network Intelligent Controller, or RIC. Both of these elements are crucial for the health of the telecom industry. Our debate today will explore whether these elements lead and which will likely be more significant in the longer term revolution in technology and business models that lie beyond 5G. I want to thank 6G World for inviting me to moderate today. As someone who focuses on policy, I relish the opportunity to spend the next 90 minutes focused on technical aspects with our esteemed panelists. So let's get started. Paul, would you do us the honors of opening up today and telling us a little bit about you, you a little bit about Ericsson and what you're doing? Sure, thanks Diane and thanks to 6G World for the invitation to speak here on this really great topic. My name is Paul Chaloner. I'm the VP of Network Product Solutions at Ericsson North America. I'm based in, in Plano, North Texas and I'm responsible for Ericsson's North American radio portfolio, which means I get to work on all kinds of fun technology topics. So I work on CBRS and mid-band and millimeter wave and open RAN, of course, and then now looking towards some of the future technologies. So I'm privileged to be part of, the, of, of a number of industry bodies. So I work with 5G Americas, then the Ongo Alliance, which used to be the CBRS Alliance, uh, Wireless Innovation Forum, and the um, part of the, the power initiative, uh, which is an NSF US Ignite initiative. So all great industry initiatives working on some, some interesting topics. And I think today I'm particularly looking forward to the confluence of really two great ideas, Open RAN and, and 6G. And so if I think about Open RAN and Ericsson's view of Open RAN is that we're very committed to open networking and open architectures, very active in ORAN Alliance, working on many of the topics debated there. And we see Open RAN as really, as you, as you mentioned in your introduction, a virtualization and cloudification of the RAN, uh, automation bringing AI to the, to the RAN too, and then also op other open interfaces. And so working actively on each of those. And then also 6G, although it still feels a little early to talk about some of the 6G topics, it's, you know, I think great to start uh, our decade long journey now into, this, into the 6G world. And then learning from our open RAN experiences and how networks are evolving today and how that will meet up in 6G. So again, great, uh, great timing to have this, this debate and uh, very excited and look forward to the discussion. Thanks, Diane. Thanks, Paul, for that. Ian, would you go next, please? Sure, it's a very hard act to follow after Paul, but I'll try my best. <laughs> so my name is Ian Wong. Uh, I am uh, Director of RF and Wireless Architecture at VIV Solutions. Um, I'm also currently the co-chair of the Test and Integration Focus Group in the ORAN Alliance. Uh, I also represent VIV in the NextG Alliance, which is kind of the 6G body, uh, or you know, the, the body working on 6G topics in North America. So yeah, uh, you know, VIV Solutions, we are a, a test and measurement company, uh, very much focused on testing the network, all aspects of it from, you know, lab testing to field testing down to um, uh, operator assurance as well. So kind of, you know, chiming in a little bit on, on what Paul's saying, you know, VIV is, is very committed to the uh, ORAN Alliance and Open RAN concepts in general. Uh, we believe it is an inflection point in how uh, we kind of design, deploy, and run uh, networks, and it will be clearly a, a, a key part of, of this ecosystem moving forward, and, and we'll see, um, you know, and debate in this panel uh, how impactful this will be uh, in 6G and, um, and beyond. So, thank you. Thanks, Ian. John Baker. Oh, John, you're on mute. That's a Freudian. A great, great to be with everybody today and uh, look forward to the discussion on Open RAN and uh, Zero Touch. Um, I'm John Baker. I'm the SDP of Business Development for Mavenir, headquartered in Dallas, Texas. Um, Mavenir has been a, a leader in virtualization of network elements, starting with the core elements moving out now into the RAN. 
Um, we're a leading supplier of virtualized IMS platforms. You know, we have over 40% global market share and supporting over 250 customers globally. So um, in some respects, we're the best kept secret in telecommunications, but um, you know, making a, a, a disruption to the telecommunications market space. Um, you know, Mavenir is a strong proponent for vendor diversity and open interfaces. Um, you know, we've been an active member of the ERAN Alliance, um, actually before the ERAN Alliance, when it was XMAG. So we've been taking a very strong role in the open interfaces um, and uh, really, you know, deploying some of the very first open RAN networks in the world. Um, we really just want to start off by saying that open RAN actually is not a technology. I think a lot of people get it mixed up to the extent that, uh, um, you know, we've got a technology movement going on in the industry as well as a philosophy or a policy type uh, discussion. You know, open RAN is about uh, uh, open interfaces and interworking. And I would say that, you know, any company that really talks about open RAN, unless they are doing active interoperability testing, then they don't really have open RAN, it stays proprietary. Um, and so to that extent, um, you know, there's uh, a whole ecosystem of uh, interworking going on in the industry. There is uh, Plugfests about to take place on a global basis. I think uh, over 45 different companies participating in uh, probably eight different plug fests going on globally. So the, the Open RAN ecosystem is forming very, very fast. And I think the ORAN Alliance um, and the model of the ORAN Alliance is, 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 is the way forward in terms of uh, specification generation, product generation, and ensuring a, a level playing field for new entrants in the telecommunication space. So in looking forward to, 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 to a, a, you know, I'm sure, a, 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 a great discussion on uh, you know how open ran fits in 6g and uh, the differences between uh, open ran and uh, zero touch great thanks john last but not least balaji um yeah hello everyone uh, i'm balaji ragotuman uh, and um, it looks like i'm surrounded by a few texans uh, but uh, I'm, I also have a Texas background. I, my, in fact, I graduated from uh, University of Texas at Dallas a long time ago and spent my first few years in, in that area. But anyway, um, uh, I'm currently uh, chief architect uh, at uh, Keysight Technologies uh, for the infrastructure solutions. Uh, and in my you know, uh, past professional life, I've been uh, with a few different infrastructure companies, including Nokia and Erwana. Uh, and so I'm, I'm, I've seen both sides of it, the infrastructure side and the test side. Uh, and the key side technologies, as you all know, uh, is a preeminent player in the test and measurement space uh, and has a long history behind it uh, and a bright future, if I may say so. And uh, you know we are very excited to be part of this open RAN movement and the ecosystem that is forming. And I echo the thoughts of all of the other you know, you know participants before me, Paul, Ian, and John, uh, in saying that uh, it has definitely been a lot of fun to see a whole new set of players getting engaged in the wireless network space mm -hmm. uh, and to interact with people. Uh, from very different industry backgrounds with very different kinds of ideas, putting them into to work into the wireless network space to make a better, more efficient network going forward. And I think that is a very good model for the future. And uh, so really looking forward to this discussion and, and the future as well. That's great. Thank you all for your comments. Let's get to some questions. So considering this is a 6G symposium, let's start with a couple of high level questions to get us going. All right, so the first question I would like each of you to answer, what will make 6G stand apart from 5G? John, would you like to go first? Yeah, I, I, think, I think really it falls back on the principles of openness and how specification work will get completed. And I think to that extent, if we follow the open principles of specifying protocols, specifying how the network works, to the extent that you know you can get down into specific specification of uh, use cases and uh, applications, etc., 
I think one of the challenges that's been, and, and you know, I have a lucky history of being involved from 2G right the way through to 5G, that you know, there's always been a piece missing, and to the extent that the piece missing has somewhat been the failure of the industry to um, actually complete the task at hand, you know, whether it be the application, whether it be an interface protocol. Um, and to that extent, you know, it sort of almost sort of slows adoption or slows innovation. And I think, um, you know, back to uh, Baji's point, you, you know, I think Open RAN is, uh, and the Open RAN Alliance has, has stimulated such an enthusiasm in the industry um, to actually get things done and, and innovate in the space that, you know, by carrying that in enthusiasm through, then, you know, we might end up with a true definition or a true use case in 6G. Um, I, I think, you know, some of the early, you know, some of the 5G discussion is still going on around the world and what is 5G and, and, and it's fantastic that, you know, we have new modulation methods from a technical perspective, you know, we have um, 5G deployment sitting out there, but in reality, um, you know, what is 5G? And, and then you can say the question is, what is 6G? You know, 5G has turned out to be a bit pipe. Is, is 6G going to be a bit pipe? You know, that's the question. And I think some of this has come down to the fact that it's become, you know, it's become such a closed ecosystem around some of these solutions that are out there today that it's, it's, it's prohibited innovation to the extent that um, new entrants, you know, and I go right back from startups to major companies, you know, how do, how do people contribute to, you know, getting the end user, and this is really what it's about, is the, the use case to the end user, um, and, you know, in, improving uh, access to information and, and mobility, if you like. Um, but I, I think, you know, what we're seeing is such enthusiasm at the beginning from coming out of the open round discussion to just follow that through and end up with not a bit pipe. I think, I think if, you know, if it becomes just another bit pipe, you know, where one could argue 5G could do that just as well. Um, you, you know, it's got to take it right the way through and say, OK, well, what is what is the compelling application that the end user is really going to be looking for? And, 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 and it's, you know, an extension of the internet in a sense, right the way through to the end user's home and, you know, freedom of access. But um, I think, you know, as, as I said earlier, you know, it may be a little bit early to, to sort of get into that 6G debate, but I think, you know, the principles need to be founded right in the beginning about uh, how, how work's going to get done, how people are going to get involved and not fall into the same pitfalls that we've been in, in the last uh, you know, you know, 2G, 3G, 4G, 5G with, uh, you know, very much a closed ecosystem. Great. Thanks, John. And same question to you. What's going to make 6G stand out? Yeah. So, you know, I, I've kind of also had the fortunate, um, you know, career to be able to start in, you know, for me, I started more in the 3G days, not, not too much in 2G, but, um, and, and basically as, as every generation moves on, you kind of see, uh, in a way, uh, really the next generation almost like coming to fruition or turning to, to you know, actually the vision of the previous generation coming to light, right? So, and, and really it's because we, we learn, we deploy um, and we get better. Um, I, I see 6G as really the, the true realization of this, uh, I would say, you know, wireless network for all and not just for, for human beings, but for machines. and. Um, you know, URLC, uh, you know, EMBB and massive machine communication truly coming to light. Um, it, it allows us to you know, also design from the ground up openness, intelligence and virtualization, right? Although these are concepts that were beginning to be uh, baked into 5G, but really it didn't really come into full swing until I would say the past couple of years. So, so 6G allows us to truly embrace those concepts um, add into the mix security, trust, and resilience. And I think that's really what, what I believe we will see in 6G is uh, getting the promise of 5G, um, you know, coming to true uh, commercialization, but at the same time with the foundational elements that Open RAN is looking into, openness, virtualization, and intelligence uh, being baked in from the get-go. Great, thanks. Balaji, 6G, what do you have to say? Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, definitely, um, you know, support the points made by both John and Ian in terms of 
the philosophy behind how the network is um, you know, envisioned and created, um, as well as the fact that um, a lot of the things that were postulated in 5G are probably really going to mature into 6G. And I know a couple of examples, you know, in particular that I think will be prominent. Uh, one is this, uh, the notion of AI. Right? Uh, AI has been postulated in 5G. Uh, you, you know, right now there is work going on in terms of how to enable AI using the RIC framework. And uh, but even uh, other than that, uh, you know, the 3GPP you know, also has similar formulation. Uh, but how all of this will evolve has been a bit of an afterthought in 5G, I would say, or came towards the latter half of 5G. But in in 6G, we truly expect AI to get baked into the cake right at the beginning. And also, at least it, I think it behooves all of us who are designing 6G to, uh, in fact, take that into account as how can we create AI native networks uh, from the ground up and, and what, what design choices do we need to make for that? I think that's one aspect. Another is a similar, uh, you know, a trend uh, that we saw taking root a little bit in the 5G timeframe, which is the, the CBRS kind of a shared spectrum or sort of more innovative spectrum utilization models. Uh, again, a bit of an add-on uh, that's happened so far, uh, but going forward into 60, uh, I do believe that the notion of spectrum utilization has to be looked at broadly across you know, the, the entire, you know, all of the bands and uh, there have to be uh, efficient and intelligent utilization models, coexistence models built into it right at the beginning. Uh, I think these will, if you ask me for, you know, sort of the two top things I would pick in which 6G may, may, may take the ball forward from 5G, those are the ones, you know, other than the, the fact that we are expanding into sub terahertz spectrum or that we, we might go into even more energy efficient, almost zero energy devices and machines to be able to, you know, uh, you know uh, also connect to the network. Um, and, and one last thing I would say is, I think truly, you know, I think another point was made about really bringing the internet right into the house, you know, and similarly sort of uh, blurring the lines between wireless and wireline technologies and, and bringing them truly into convergence, I think. That would be one big challenge of 6G as well. Great, thank you for that, Paul. So I'm actually, a, <laughs> yeah, I'm actually a lot more positive about 5G than John, <laughs> Ian, and, and Balaji. Uh, I mean, I but every day I'm I'm working building out 5G across the U.S. So I think actually it's it's doing pretty well, and it's it's got a long way to go still. But the if you look at the the aspirational goal of 5G in the U.S. certainly is one and a half trillion dollars of economic impact, four million jobs created, and so we started with mobile broadband and some of the consumer pieces, and we're moving into industry and the digitalization benefit across our industries, and we're just starting to get there. And so for me, like we're really poised to re nicely re realize the, the promise of 5G. But I think the question was 6G. And so first of all, the caveat that yes, it's a crystal ball, we're the decade away, that decade long kind of clock is ticking down now and it feels like immediate pressure to, to get going on the definition. And then I would say, you know, what, is the, what are the pools for, for 6G? I mean, we're just doing 5G, so why do we need another generation? What's wrong with what we have? So I think the, the pull is the expectation that we have on the network. And one of the first things is I want limitless or consumers and industry wants limitless connectivity. That means everywhere on the planet, in the middle of the ocean, the middle of the desert, wherever you are, I want connectivity and high speed, low latency, high, high reliability connectivity. So that limitless connectivity is needed. The second is a point that I haven't heard yet is around sustainability. And so right now, when we talk about 5G sustainability, we say, oh, 5G, the energy efficiency of 5G is, is 30, 40% better energy per bit than 4G, and that's great. And we're working on reducing the, the energy consumption of networks. But sustainability is much greater than that. And if we look at the 17 UN sustainability goals, 6G can contribute heavily in many areas. 
And so I think we're going to see a lot of that. You know, one interesting application we talk about is the Earth Monitor concept. And the Earth Monitor is a massive planetary set of sensors that allows us to monitor the environmental conditions, to understand truly what's happening in global temperature change, to let, let us understand what's happening in the environment. So things like the Earth Monitor and other contributions to those 17 UN goals will be a pivotal part of 6G. But as it gets more and more entwined with our lives, the expectation on trustworthiness of the network will grow hugely. And so trustworthiness is really beyond security. It's beyond, okay, I'm resistant to hackers doing bad things in my network. It's really making sure that everything in the network is as it should be. Software is delivered that was expected to be delivered, that hardware is, is the hardware it purports to be. And so that whole trustworthiness concept is important. And today, I mean, one of the buzz, buzzwords is zero trust architecture. And so it is a journey from today to, you know, into 6G to, to implement more and more uh, true to the principles of zero trust as we as we go through time. So zero trust will be important. Other trustworthiness concepts like confidential computing, where in the network compute fabric, I have elements and instances of compute that are dedicated to me, encrypted and access only to me or my network slice. So these are all important, piece, important pieces. But the, the, the true desire for a network is I want it to simplify my life and or everyone's life, of course. And so the concepts that bring simplification to life today, a lot of those are AI based. So many AI things today help our lives. So AI will be at the very heart of, of 6G as I think Balaji mentioned. But then that's the pull part. The push part, technology is, is really providing enablers for us and enablers for 6G. And so whether that's new processes or accelerators or whether that's meta material. So, uh, materials that change their electrical properties depending on the electrical current going through them that, that allow us to do new antenna structures. Very exciting areas. Advances in cloud, advances in AI is sort of we take as red. Uh, Balaji mentioned an interesting one, the zero energy device. That's the concept of, you know, I don't need a battery in my device. My device, my, the, typically for IoT or some, some kind of sensor, is harvesting radio energy from the radio environment and then providing a sensor pool. So that's a very exciting uh, concept that silicon is improving. So whether it's mixed signal processing or, or digital front ends or faster digital to analog converters, all these are great enablers for, for radio and the RAN technology especially. So all of these will come into play. So that's the pull and the push, but okay, for what? What would be, you know, give me an example of an application that we're gonna, we're gonna see in 6G. And so one of the families of applications that I think is going to be big is something that we call the Internet of Senses, where every sense that we have will be far more integrated and far more personal into the network. So if we take vision, for example, so that's a sort of more straightforward one, whether it's telepresence or holographic presence, uh, you know, whether it is, is extended reality, augmented reality, all those things will, will improve. So that's a vision piece. Then if we look at touch, we have the advent of haptics on tactile internet. I mean, imagine the, 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 if you've seen the movie Ready Player One, the haptic suits they have, these will become realities. And then, you know, I think my, my favorite one maybe is digital smell. So to be able to have at the other end of the call, to be able to replicate the smell of whatever's on the other end of the call to what you're doing, and then ha having that as an experience of the, of the environment is gonna be very powerful. It has to be used carefully, of course. But then I think, Another piece is around digital twins. And so today we think of maybe a jet engine that we model a digital version of that and we can do some digital twin, but we're gonna go through the digital twin continuum where we can model things far more sophisticated than, than a jet engine. So a whole smart city, for example. So all massive parts of our lives we can model or a whole factory. So from end to end, from input to output of a factory, you can be modeled as a digital twin. So we can interact with that digital twin world very powerfully. So all of these are really important. Also, things like the, 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 ro the world of robotics will also intersect with 6G. So we're going to have you know, significant um, advances in robotics. Cobots, the cooperative robots, will be kind of running around helping us and making our lives easier. So the Internet of Senses, the digital twin continuum, and the advent of robotics kind of will be the applications that realize the kind of push and pull of what we have from today from what I would consider already a, a successful baseline of 5G. So that's, that's my view or our view of 6G. That's great. I, I'd like to get into a little deeper into your comments and your comments at the beginning where you were talking about, um, you know, defining 6G as we continue to roll out 5G. Is it too early to define 6G? And 
it's a two part question. Is it too early? And are technologies advancing so quickly that it's going to change the way we look at the typical 10 year life cycle for the next G? Yeah, I think I think that's a good question, Diane. And I, I think I was going to comment on top of what Paul just said that, um, you know, and firstly, you know, 5G has made great progress. So don't take me wrong. It's not a, a negative against 5G. I think the real the real issue on 5G is what is the end result to the end user? Um, you know, it's great to see the coverage maps come up on TV every night and how everybody is making great progress and deploying, you know, 5G coverage. But in reality, you know, are we addressing the true end user needs you know we talk about rural broadband in the us and the numbers of people that still haven't got uh, you know even internet basic internet services and um you know half the world is you know still got a lot of you know billions of un, you know unconnected people and and i think you know back to your point of, of the technology getting out beyond us i think you know some of the things that paul just talked about i would argue are things that are, are great from a technologist perspective and, and a great way to you know put the the, the nice ideas out there, but in reality, if we truly solve the problem that we set out back with 2G in the first place to solve in terms of mobile connectivity um, to, to the majority of the planet's population. And I think, you know, we've got a long, long way to go. Um, you know, there's been a lot of discussion about, you know, voice services even, you know, and in reality, you know, 2G, I think has got a long tail ahead of itself. And, and, and for, you know, for just basic voice services, cheap mobile phones, et cetera, for a lot of the people that can't afford these technologies, you know, 2G, 2G would be a great service if they could get it. Um, and, and, and I think, you, you know, where we're at is, you know, we're gallivanting off and trying to invent, you know, um, all these new sexy, uh, pardon the expression, but, uh, um, you know, applications. And, and yet, yeah, you know, people want basic internet connectivity. And I think, you know, back to, to, to Baiji's point about, you know, zero power for controlling devices. I, I think addressing some or more of those technology issues that take the barriers, if you like, of mobile coverage um, from a 6G perspective into areas that don't get coverage. You know, convergence, for instance, of cable technology and mobile technology. You know, we've got a great asset there in the cable plant sitting in, in you know, around the world that could actually be reutilized from a spectrum perspective in the same way that the spectrum in the air is actually used. So, you know, how do cable networks converge with wireless networks? And and, 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 and I think, you know, if, if the industry can take a tangential look at, uh, uh, you know, how 6G plays in the world in terms of, you know, green energy, you know, low cost devices to um, people that really need it and, and convergence of, you know, this, some of these disparate technologies that we've got going on so that, you know, people can make far better use of seamless connectivity um, of some of this. And, and I think, you know, We've got to avoid this. We've got to do 6G because we've got to do 6G and we've got to do 6G because we want this latest factory optimization and, and, and that type of stuff, you know, really, really, really bring it back to the roots and say, you know, we've got to address the, the consumer and we've got to address the, you know, the other 3 billion of unconnected users out there. And how do we do that with a technology that, you know, gives us bandwidth and, and, and these things come at a cost, but but on the other side of it, you know, to get some of these coverage applications in place that, you know, we talked about on, in terahertz, frequency bands and that, densification of mobile base stations is going to be huge. So, you, you know, there's going to be business in there for all in terms of densification. But some of these also are, you know, sort of anomalies in terms of the way they work against each other. But I think over the next, you know, eight to 10 years, Dean, they've just got to work through that and, and really say, how do we, how do we address some of the holes that have been left by mobile mobile networks today? And we shouldn't do it for the sake of technology or for the sake of trying to sell a, another network to a mobile network operator. Yeah, I think. Oh, Balaji, go ahead, please. Yeah, I think I think some really good points made. And and just to talk about your question about the time frame, is it too early? I think I think one of the things I would say that for a lot of the reasons that were mentioned here. Um, if you really want to reimagine the network, uh, the number of use cases that we need to support have exploded. And the way in which we want to support them has also changed significantly or, or at least evolved significantly. And if we want to not repeat some of the mistakes of the past in terms of um, we, we, let's say, do this serially, right? So, so there is, uh, you know, uh, uh, a certain set of specifications 
and then we evolved upon a whole new set of specifications for the purpose of opening up the RAN, right? They are kind of adds on. And, and if we want to take a different approach, if we want to think of it holistically, we need to start earlier. Uh, and I, I just wanted to say that the, the number of different spectrum bands and the number of different coexistence options and the number of different use cases, all of these have increased or multiplied. And uh, in order to provide sufficient attention to this, just from a technology point of view, I think we do need to start early and, and think through those. Uh, but you know, I, I not to diminish the points that were made before me in terms of the, the types of use cases and the reasons why we want to do them are also equally important. And when it comes to spectrum and, and those issues, you always know that there is there are policy uh, implications. And so those kinds of things take longer to stabilize uh, and, and all the more reason to get started on that. Great, thanks so much, Balaji. I am going to spend a couple more minutes and take a question from the audience, and then I'm gonna turn it over to Ian to talk about Open RAN. Um, okay. So we got a question from the audience. Previous 5G and 6G conferences led us to believe that 5G was built for business uses and 6G would be the bit pipe for consumers. Has 5G failed in both business and consumer use cases? And I will just add on to that. Has, has things changed or has just not enough time has elapsed in order to, to build up those use cases in 5G. Um, so Paul, I'm not sure if you wanna take that or one of the other. Sure, I can start. So like I said, I'm, I'm very positive about the, the outcomes we're seeing in 5G. We're seeing the, the, the coverage in, in low and mid and high band. So for example, so in the US, we have coverage of, of three networks that cover over 200 million by population people. Uh, we have started with the, effectively the consumer experience. And so we've, we've created faster speeds, lower latency, and a better consumer service. But to the, the question's point, the, the original intent was to really make sure that we move into the business domain. And so that is happening. And so then, and the, and the, the benefit there is that of digitalization. And we've actually seen it through the COVID times is that all industries have been digitalizing, digitalizing their industries much faster. And those industries that are digitalized faster are being more successful. And they rely on the underlying network that has reliability, faster speeds and better performance to for that digitalization benefit. And it is happening. So for example, I mean, we're the Ericsson factory here down just down the road from me is that we we have a 5G capabilities where we make our 5G radios. We have we're using 5G to run that factory. And so that is a, it's a real life use case of 5G making a difference in industry. And so the 300,000 factories, for example, in the US can take advantage of that, fi that 5G capability to improve their efficiency and ability in the manufacturing segment. We've seen whether it's whether logistics or healthcare, healthcare in every segment we've seen with proof of concepts and early use cases that in each of these parts of the industry, which is allowing and creating the platform for innovation. And we're seeing every day new, new use cases, whether it's drones or autonomous vehicles, all these things are happening. They're happening in, in a, in a initially, initial way and they're starting to scale commercially. So for me, we're seeing really good signs. We're seeing the, the fundamental infrastructure built there because this is an infrastructure for economic improvement uh, on, a, on a global basis. And that is being built out right now and that they will, we will see those benefits, they'll be realized by industry and enterprise as we go forward. So I'm very positive about it. And I think there's already been a lot of innovation that can be more, and that will lead into, into, into 6G for further, more of the kind of use cases I was talking about earlier. I do not see that, not in, that neither 5G nor 6G are designed as a bit pipe. That is not the case. These are transformational technologies which will impact all our lives. And I would argue are already impacting all our lives. Great, thanks, Paul. You know, I, 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 you know, I, I have to say, you know, the world, when you go around the world, 5G is in a very different position, country by country, and I think the US is certainly ahead of the world in terms of deployment of 5G, but there's still a lot of people that are sitting on the fence and still going to make five, you know, true 5G decisions, and hence, you, you know, the really push for open RAN in, in 5G, in the 5G space, um, and, uh, you, you know, those choices have got to be made, but I think you know when you when you come down to the basics of it, and, and at the end of the day, it comes down to the you know people who are going to pay the bills. Yes, you're going to get industrial applications. You know we're seeing industrial applications of 5G um, around the world. But you, you know what we struggle with in some sense is what is the consumer's 
use of 5G apart from a bit by in, in terms of internet connectivity. And, um, you, you know, and, and, and there's a whole debate going on as well in, in the broadband, rural broadband markets of, of, of you know, what's, up, what's the up speed, what's the down speed. And, you know, and I, I sort of believe that, you know, even if those guys could get their hands on LTE, 5G, then, you know, you get rural broadband. And, um, but, but from an end consumer perspective, it's, you know, how to, how to present this to an end consumer and speed test, you know, which is what you see, you know, everybody's hyping around, oh, I've got great speed, and I've got great latency, but what else do I get with it? You, you know, and that's, and that's the million dollar question. And I think there's a great opportunity for people to innovate around, you know, 5G, 6G. And, and I think Open RAN is, is, is certainly seeing this innovation, if you like, and, you know, Open RAN is, is, is really encouraging all to participate through open interfaces and direct channels to sell. You know, in the 4G world, if you like, in the previous world where it's really locked down by the incumbent suppliers, it's, very, it's almost impossible for an innovator to sell their product to a mobile operator. And, and under the Open RAN ecosystem that, uh, you, you know, new suppliers can put their ideas out there. And I think, you know, if you look at the Open Round Alliance um, membership, you know, there's what, 200 plus members of, of the Open Round Alliance, the Open Round Policy Coalition, there's 40 plus members, sorry, yeah, 40 plus members or 60 plus members of the Open Round Policy Coalition. Um, so, you, you know, you can see the interest there, the pent up energy of the hyperscalers and, uh, you know, the technology providers to really, you know, support Open Round, really support network initiatives. And, and, and I think, you know, with, with the discussion of even in 5G and moving into 6G, we need to find the vehicle that allows that innovation to really get to the consumer. And, 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 and some of this will come down through, you know, definition of specifications, definitions of, of product solutions that will be um, essentially become standardized and, and, and take advantage of the, of the scale of the mass market. And, you know, I think a good example of that, you know, when we started 2G is, you know, look at the mobile phone, you know, the mobile phone has, has got interfaces fully wrapped around it, fully specified, some of the features are not, but, but you know, there's a huge mobile, mobile ecosystem which vendors are supplying into and we shouldn't, shouldn't lose sight of that and, um, and everything that goes with it. Great, thanks. Thanks for that. Chat. I don't know, maybe Dan, can I just make one quick point? Sorry, I know I'm going out sure, of turn. One, here, one quick point, then I want to. One real super quick, in. super quick point. So, I mean, we, we anticipate, or Ericsson Mobility Report, I mean, we, we're thinking that. 2026 that 60% of the of the world's population will be covered by 5G. So in a 10 year cycle we get to year 6 if we say say 5G started in 2020 year 6 we have half the world's population covered. So I think that's that's to put it in context. And then what we're seeing is that that 5G delivers a tenth of the cost per bit over 4G. So I think that you know those some of those principles of coverage and you know global benefit are met. And sorry that was the end of my quick point. Great, thanks for that. And let's talk about Open RAN. You are the co-chair of the test and integration focus group at the ORAN Alliance. Can you tell, so I want, and I'm gonna pull in an audience question. So I'm going to a two-part question here. Sure. Can you give us a level set? What is Open RAN? And then the question is, um, can you expand on how Open RAN will enable innovation? Is the innovation the RAN itself or is the innovation in the services that use our radio networks? So great question. So your ORAN Alliance, what is ORAN? What is Open RAN? Yeah, I think Paul kind of mentioned that a little bit during his opening remarks and, and really at, at the end of the day, ORAN Alliance, you know, is is uh, is a group of, uh, you know, it, it was founded by some, um, you know, China Mobile, AT&T and, and se several operators. It used, you know, there's the next RAN forum from North America kind of merged with uh, CRAN. Uh, forum from um, you know kind of uh, Asian uh, operators there, and so so that was kind of happened a couple of years ago. Um, its mission is really to come up with open, intelligent, um, virtualized, and interoperable networks, right? So those those are four key tenets of of the ORAN Alliance. There's over 300 members um, and participants today. Uh, it's a vibrant kind of you know, you know it's at the end of the day it is a specification body. It's meant to come up with uh, open interfaces, uh, open intelligence. Uh, you know, it also does quite a bit of um, you know the test integration forum, which is the, the the group I chair. It's a it's a key part of ORAN Alliance as well, uh, because again, at the heart of it is interoperating different pieces of the network. 
Uh, and finally, the open software community, another key tenet of the uh, Orange Alliance is uh, you know, coming up with open source uh, software solutions that can be used for really early innovation and, and really um, opening up this ecosystem, right? So, um, you know, that's kind of, I guess, ORAN Alliance in, in kind of a nutshell. Um, as far as the question on, on the innovation part, I think it's a great question. And um, I, I, I would say it's really both, right? You can think of um, when you open up interfaces, when you open up hardware and software, it really opens up the ecosystem for players to come in and be able to um, come come up, you know, with innovative solutions. Um, and you know, there's special sauce in a specific vertical. You know, we talk a lot about five G being for enterprise or for you know private networks, and these are usually very specialized areas. For example, industrial IoT, smart factories, or or automotive, and and these are verticals that, although traditionally they don't you know, maybe back in the 4G days, they really don't play a big role in the development of the specifications for, for RAN. Um, and Open RAN allows uh, a lot more companies, a lot more players to play into kind of really adding value to their specific uh, vertical. I think that's one. Uh, and finally, you know, that, that's kind of, in a way it's, it's really both the RAN itself uh, opens it up, you know, it's, it's softwareized, it's virtualized. Uh, and, and also open, so that it allows for innovation both in the RAN itself and in the services on top of it. Um, so, so I think that's at least my, my two cents on that. That's great. Thanks, Anne. So John, the question that I get asked most often, are Open RAN and ORAN the same thing, or they're different? No, they're, they're, they're not. And, you know, they're very much truly related. And, you know, ORAN is all about, you know, the, the ORAN Alliance where specifications are actually produced and doing a fantastic job in, in cleaning up the holes that have been left by 3GPP in, in the specifications to ensure there's a completely specified end-to-end -end mobile network. Open RAN is about, you know, the ecosystem and how to bring uh, interoperability and, and, and level the playing field, if you like. It's about vendor diversity. Um, and to that extent, you know, that's what my, my, my comment earlier, you know, you hear companies talk about, oh, we, we're open, you know, we've got open RAN. But in reality, it's another form of proprietary RAN because they have no intent to do um, any interworking. So, um, you know, and, 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 and as Mavine, you know, we, we, we asked Ericsson, Nokia, Huawei, and all the others that are participating, in, not, not Huawei, but some Samsung, et cetera, you know, we're open to do interworking. And, and once interworking is, is, is out there, then, you know, operators can choose. And I think, you know, you go back to the foundation, you know, why did ORAN Alliance really come into place on day one? You know, it's the frustration of a, of a very large group of carriers to the existing vendor ecosystem. And, and to that extent, you know, that's why, um, you know, this whole interoperability thing, you know, that uh, Ian was talking about and these, plug tests, et cetera, really showing that, uh, you know, you can follow a model that's very similar to the internet. You know, it's, it's really plug and play um, and, you know, ensuring that you can put these models together. And, um, you know, and there's a lot of naysayers that, uh, you, you know, come up with problems, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, the great thing about, you know, the community around, you know, 5G, 6G is that, uh, you know, we all like technical challenges and, um, you know, these problems will get solved and um, there will be solutions to this. And, and this is what, you know, this is really where the innovation part really comes from. And, you know, people are, are getting up and solving these problems. So, um, you know, and I think the other piece I would comment on is that, you know, not only have we had the opening of interfaces and then, you know, interoperability, but we've also got a technology change that's going on in this whole process of moving from, custom silicon to you know using the ability of office off the shelf microprocessors um, such as x86 you know that i can now do in an x86 processor what you can do with custom silicon for certain applications and um and and, and that's important to realize and as, as technology moves on these changes are going to get faster and faster and faster and and how do you use these um, in advancing technology cycles to, to get benefit to the consumer. Um, and, and, and I think that's really what Open RAN is, and, and the Open RAN Alliance is, is really trying to do is to, is to make use of billions and billions of dollars of R&D investment that are coming in from multiple different companies 
and, and bring that into the mobile community in the same way that uh, the internet has actually done the same. Thanks, John. I want to follow up on your comments and bring in a question from the audience. Um, the question is, do you have a timeline for open RAN adoption in commercial networks? Is there somebody that would like to take that and focus on? Yeah, I can, I can, I can, sum, I can summarize a very interesting debate that took place about two weeks ago about this. You know, the question was, you know, when, the, when, when does 50% of uh, RAN sales equal open RAN sales? And everybody was sort of hovering around 2028 to 2029, uh, 2030. And, and, and the view is that if, if a, uh, a large you know, tier one carrier you know, really got behind the adoption of open RAN, it would happen faster. But, you know, I think the industry is sort of coalescing around 2028 to 2030 for a 50% market share of open RAN versus closed RAN. That's great, thanks. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah maybe I can add. Yeah, yeah, I could add. I mean, I think it depends what portion of, of Open RAN we're talking about, I think, as well. So, I mean, we look at, you know, Cloud RAN or the virtualization part. And so that's an early, earlier part, potentially, where now, as, as, as Ericsson normally would take Ericsson software and hardware and have them as one entity, now we give our customers the option to have Ericsson software and running that on commercial servers. And so that virtualization, which is a good step towards more softwareization, I hate that word, of the, of the network, uh, and uh, more, that provides more flexibility for things like network slicing. So we see that as something that's, that's a, a good foundation for the future, and networks will have more and more virtualization of the RAN as we go forward. So that's, that's one part of it. The second part is the, the automation. And so we'll, we'll talk about RICs and, and AI and things like that in a, probably in a minute. But those, those type of automations then will, will come into play. And that needs some of these platforms to, that underpin that automation to be put in place. And so that's sort of, sort of the next step. So really it depends on the, the, the exact part of Open RAN that we're talking about. But we certainly see that, that RAN virtualization and Cloud RAN is a, you know, one of the earlier parts to, to happen. And then also it depends on the market segment. So we see whether it's indoor or enterprise potentially is an earlier segment, then rural is maybe another segment, and then urban maybe a later segment. So it depends on the, the segmentation of the market as well as in terms of the timeline. And then obviously the country and their 5G cycle as well. Yeah, I, I do want to add, I mean, like there are carriers today, especially more greenfield development carriers, think about Rakuten, think about DISH, who are who have decided to use Open RAN uh, from the get-go. And so, so we're talking about, if the question is, when is it, getting commercialized and if you say commercialization means an operator is deploying it then then it's today right but but to to john's point i mean if, if we're talking about significant market share then then yeah i, I would say it's going to be a few years down the road yeah. thank you for that and paul thank you for teeing up my next question Palaji, let's talk about the rick the ran intelligent controller can you give us a little bit more detail on what the rick does for the system Sure. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so, so Rick is uh, the RAN intelligence controller, as you said. Um, this is really a creation within the ORAN architecture, right? It's not something uh, that's that's directly specified in 3GPP. It is a way for the um, the the industry and the network to um, uh, focus its energy. Uh, in a certain architectural module or entity uh, where all of the intelligence for the RAN, uh, like the you know, major parts of radio resource management or what used to be called SON in, in, in past, and it's still called SON in, in a lot of places, um, things like mobility and handover management, um, and a lot more of the newer emerging use cases where the intelligence of the network needs to be focused and, and processed in a very uh, sort of a, um, uh, complex way. Uh, it's a module for, for those kinds of things to be done. And when I say module, it is still not a single module. There is um, a further disaggregation into what is called the near real-time RIC and the non-real-time RIC. And the uh, you know, sort of the, the, the dividing line between the two uh, is how fast you have to turn things around from the time you make some observations to the time you have to make decisions. And if it is of the order of seconds, then you're probably, or less, then you're in the near real time, Rick. 
uh, if it's in the order of days or, or, or hours, then you're in the non-real-time rig. This is very sort of a, a rough way of putting it. There are finer descriptions in the ORAN you know, specifications themselves. Uh, but um, uh, the, the idea is that all of the RAN modules like the DU and the CU and RU as well uh, will provide measurements, will provide data to uh, the, the, these centralized entities. And these entities would then be able to crunch through them uh, either using AIML or not. I mean, I mean there are perfect places where AIML can, can exist, but that, that's not really mandated or anything like that. Uh, but uh, all of these measurements, uh, the, these, these things, these are applications that sit in uh, the, in the RIC uh, as a whole uh, called X apps and R apps. And they take in these measurements and they do whatever processing they need to do. And they put out uh, their, their own outputs in terms of uh, controlling or configuring or reconfiguring the certain network entities as they see fit. So it's a way of formalizing all of this things that used to be um, or still, you know, for the large part exist uh, within, let's say, the G node V or within a certain, you know, proprietary entity uh, with proprietary interfaces. Uh, so it, what it does really is uh, by opening up these interfaces, providing the uh, mechanism for a large number of players. Uh, to enter the, this X app and R app kind of uh, uh, market and provide applications, provide AI ML engines uh, that are able to do these really specialized things. So there could be many, many different X apps and R apps sitting in the rig, and each of them could be doing very different thing. Like one of them could be uh, control the flight path of a unmanned aerial vehicle or something like that, or, you know to the the day to day sort of the really um, you know um, uh, well known things like mobility management and traffic uh, you know tracking for example so so that's kind of Rick in a nutshell um, and uh, you know it's it's uh, looks like it's really showing great promise uh, from the level of interest we are seeing uh, and we sort of look forward to real life applications uh, and services as we move forward. Thank you. So help build this out a little bit for us. What is does this look like for 6G compared to what it is playing out today in 5G? Um, I think, yeah, go ahead. I would say, I think that's a great, great explanation of, of, of the RIC functionality is sort of just coming out of, uh, you know, the ORAN Alliance and, and how some of this is going to develop. And I think, if you take that vision forward and, you know, so one of the visions that, um, you know, we've really been pushing is that, you know, the RIC actually starts to look like the Apple, the Apple store. Um, and to the extent that I can have third party applications sitting on a RIC controller that are coming, that, that are designed for a specific use, you know, if, um, and, and to that extent, you know, the, the RIC app store could actually sit, you know, within the RAN right at the base station site. And, and, and you could have a Diane Rinaldo uh, RIC application that just looks after your day-to-day -day service um, as you move through the network. So that, um, you know, your services, your quality of service, et cetera, that you pay for is everywhere you go. And, and, and I think that's the excitement as you take that into 6G to the extent that um, you know, you've got all this innovation that, that creates apps in the same way that Apple created apps for the iPhone. You can create apps and, and, and commercialize apps for the RAN and then um, taking it forward, then they can be personalized. Um, you know, the days of having central sign, I think they're moving very quickly to, you know, it's all moving to the edge and you take that extreme and once I get it to the edge, I'm going to get it down to a personal level. Um, and I think that's a sort of a great business opportunity sitting out there and, uh, and, and I'm looking forward to the day when I see the first uh, RAN app store actually uh, commercialized. So I think, uh, and we're not too far away from that either. So I think that is a, that's a, but, you know, that should be the sort of thought process that goes into 6G. And I, and I would add to that, that it's, if we look at the sophistication of those R apps, I mean, today they're, they're basic network control. So, I mean, if you think about the old pre, prior to, to, to R apps, there's, there's a element management or a management system that the operator is using to control the network. Now we bring in an R app, so we have an application, so it's more programmable, but it starts with 
scripts or basic programs to do things. Then we get to more sophisticated, the, like this SON example, uh, that we can get more and more sophisticated, but then we're gonna bring in AI into these applications. And then AI is gonna run more and more of those applications. But it is super easy to say, throw some AI at that and we'll solve a bunch of problems. Mm -hmm. It is much harder to do that than in, than in, in practice. So the evolution path over the next few years will be the incre incremental sophistication of those applications, the increased use of AI, and the richness of variety of that of the, the the applications running on the on the app store and so the power of those applications is, is going to be high and so you know not, I, I like the, the not i'm not quite sure what the the Diane ronaldo app is going to do but the next the, the app after that will be for example you can bring in non-ran functionality into that so if, for example if i can say i want to to have the network perform differently when it's raining so weather dependency control of the network so you're bringing in non-RAM capabilities into that RAM, so you can make all kinds of decisions to 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 uh, to control the network in the most granular way, to make it more efficient, than make the network running more efficient, to make it easier to run, but also something we call intent-based architectures, where you're not doing the detailed level control of the network, but you're describing an intent. Now, I want to use Spectrum more efficiently, or I want my VIP users to get a better service. So you describe the intent that's translated to a service layer and then to a network layer. So then the sophistication of this, of the of control and the granularity of control of RAN really will be enhanced over time as we move to from, from 5 to 6G. But that control mechanism and the R app and the service management and orchestration, which is the platform that runs that, is going to get more and more importance and more and more sophisticated over time. Great. I appreciate bringing in the brightest minds in telecom to figure out what my app's going to do. <laughs> <laughs> love it to teach my kids to solve <laughs> We can spend the rest of the time. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's, let's dive into the theme of this panel today. A focus on interoperability versus zero touch control. The idea of bringing together interconnectedness with the autonomous network. So John, let me put the first question to you. What is the difference between ORAN interoperability and zero touch control? And why is zero touch so important to this conversation? Yeah, keep, keep, keeping it fairly simple, you know, the interoperability or ORAN or open RAN is essentially taking, you know, two manufacturers and, and, and putting their equipment together to a defined specification that came out of the ORAN Alliance and, and actually making sure that it's fully functional. Right, and, and and there's a lot, as I say, uh, there's a lot of that going on in the in, in the world today with uh, all these new vendors coming into this open round space. But um, you know, zero touch, if you like, is 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 is, is the ability to, you know, softwareize the deployment of a network is is one way to look at it. And, and so from that perspective, you know, they're different, but but zero touch processes, if you like, are all about, you know, how can I build a cell site in four minutes? Um, whereas it would take generally weeks to do it in the conventional way. Um, you know, when I first started building networks in the US, you know, many years ago, you know, it would take months to build a cell site. And then, you know, you were sending engineers out to, to load software, correct software, make firmware fixes and everything else. Whereas in, in, in the open land world, you know, where stuff is moving into the cloud and in the data center, if I use zero touch software, then I'm, I have the ability to clone all of the software, feed it all into the equivalent base station sites and bring up a base station very quickly. And, and you know, to cite Rapitan, you know, the, they were bringing up cell sites on, on, in four minutes from, from, from being flat to in the air um, and, and doing that through zero touch software. And, you know, we're going to see that coming to fruition as well with this in the US very soon, you know, when they, uh, uh, really get to launch the network, but that's employing zero touch mechanisms to to deploy the network. So I think to that extent, um, you, you know, you're going to see zero touch becoming a very big part of this whole thing. And, you know, and then AI, you know, with zero touch, you know, modifying the algorithms, if you like, or modifying the processes such that um, networks can be built, networks can be trolled, traffic can be, tro be controlled. Because I think, you know, the other piece of it is that you build open RAN networks in a very different way to you build these conventional custom hardware networks. Um, you, you know, I, I, I use the principle of actually, you know, when you build an open RAN network, you know, that's fully virtualized, you, you build it for zero capacity. 
Now that may sound really odd to a lot of people, but in reality, um, you know, 80% of the traffic is only using 20% of the network. So, you know, I've got, you know, 80% of my network is sitting idle for most of the day. So why, do, why on earth do I want to pay for hardware that sits out there doing nothing all day long? Um, if I can put it in a compute fashion, put it in a data center, and then automate the processes, you know, through zero touch and AI as the traffic moves, you know, it goes from, you know, Washington to, to the suburbs, you know, the traffic is moving out in the evening. If I can have a network that's following me around and only using the capacity where I need it and, and turning all the other cell, cell sites off, I'm getting, you know, I'm getting a green effect. I'm getting intelligence in my network. From a network deployment perspective, I'm paying minimum cost in licenses. You know, there's huge benefits, you know, once you start to wrap software and, and, and you know, in terms of zero touch processes and artificial intelligence around the mobile network. But, you know, it's a whole new way of thinking. And, uh, you know, when you walk into a, a network operator and start to say, okay, well, first of all, you build your network for zero capacity. Uh, and then, you know, we'll worry about where all the capacity licenses sit, et cetera, et cetera. You know, it's a, it's a whole new ball game. But I think, you know, Again, Open RAN is sort of giving the ability to do that, which you, you know you can't do today in uh, the fixed hardware networks. Great, thanks, John. Paul, the next question is for you. So, what are some of the general objectives, approaches, and benefits of using an autonomous approach? And can you give us a sense of the orchestration, how it all comes together? Yeah, I think I mean John did a good description there from from basic integration to full network automation at a very sophisticated level and so but a lot of it if you look at the realities today and as someone who kind of you know build these networks today i mean you're trying to optimize thousands of network parameters and so when you're bringing up a site you do that for a, for a time you know specific time that you're bringing up the site and then we rely on, on techniques like self-optimizing networks to be able to kind of do that on a continuous basis but to, to abstract that level of automation even higher uh, using AI techniques and constantly watching the network for the performance of the network, meeting KPIs, meeting the service level agreements, moving capacity around the network uh, is, is something that's very attractive to operators. So it reduces the, the labor intensity and stops for people doing kind of routine tasks in the network and then can move them to kind of more meaningful work. And then is a major cost saving as well for the operators to make the operate the, the network run more efficiently. And then if you think about the cost of spectrum these days, it's pretty high. So if you can use your spectrum more efficiently, that means you need less spectrum, less Hertz for a given uh, data tonnage, then that's another cost saving, another advantage. But then, and then the user experience is then tailored in a better way. So users feel, so the consumer or the industry get a better experience. The ability to be able to, to honor a service level agreement with an enterprise or a factory or, or a consumer becomes higher. So you have closed loop mechanisms that manage service level agreement. So cost saving, network performance optimization there, but then you take it to the new, the service level, right? So introducing new services quickly is a revenue opportunity. So if I can, if I think of a new service today, it takes quite a while to get from that service idea to network implementation. If I can cut that, ta that time dramatically to go from service to implementation back to the intent-based architectures that I was talking about before, then time to revenue and the amount of revenue, the level of innovation can also be amped up in the network. So really a big slew of, of, of benefits. Now, all of these are we need to do this incrementally because it's taken us a while just to get to the point we're at today in the network so it's e it's certainly easier said than done but the the pathway and the architectures that we're constructing will allow this really large set of possibilities to be to be made possible so uh, you know certainly looking forward to seeing that how net networks change with this new capability great thank you so a question to the group do you see any engineering challenges <laughs> There's a ton of engineering challenges. <laughs> that, that's why we go to work in the morning. You know? We have 25 minutes no, left. It will just to... happen magically. No, I mean, uh, it's, that's why we have you all. <laughs> is the question more on the uh, on on the open RAN side or on the six Gs? I mean, uh, was there any context to to that on on which side? Uh, the question is about. No, just as we as we bring in um, autonomous networks, is there any engineering challenges as it all comes together? Yeah, I, yeah, I, I mean, 
I, I would say, yeah, why don't you hear it, Paul? Yes, go ahead. No, no, I, I mean, I, I mean, I'd say, I just, I could just start with what I think there's, there's many, but I think first is, you know, we need to get some of the basics right. So we need to define this interface that we're talking about that, that enables the App Store and all these R apps, this R1 interface. I think Ian and his colleagues are, you know, working on defining that in our alliance. So that needs to be well defined. So it really becomes open. Uh, or becomes standardized and open. And so that's that's a key enabler. And then I think the plat getting the platform in place, this, so this service management and orchestration platform will become important to make sure we have a platform for all this good stuff that we're talking about. And then making sure that we also have a software development environment that, that apps that app providers that anyone can basically start developing to. So, so known interfaces, interoperable interfaces, software development uh, environments that can be used. Uh, so we really open up that the landscape to, to multiple R app providers. I mean, there are some, but I think then on top of the basic engineering of, of capacity engineering and, and security and, and robustness and all those kinds of things, because when you think about it, you can't just let loose an AI program and say, okay, I control my network now. It has to have some guardrails, right? You, you have to kind of do that in a very measured, careful way. And you need to, to have you know, explainable AI. You need to make sure that, that what the AI is doing is doing it in, a, in an ethical way, in an unbiased way, in a, in a way as it was intended. So I think there's many of these things need to come together. And as we've known, if we look at you know, history from basic operation and maintenance systems to the sophistication we have today, I mean, that's taken a long time. So this is not something that will happen overnight, but I think we've got the right architectures for it to be, to, to be a, a foundation for right now. Yeah, I guess thing, I would just... Thing yeah i mean the, the only thing i would add to that is again like with, with all you know you're, there's there's you know automation there's ai there's ml these are let's say you know you know softwareization concepts that really have predominantly been in the it world for a long time and now it's kind of intersecting really let's call it with the communications world and I mean, ultimately, you know, it is a muscle that the communication industry is still building, right? Obviously, there are more and more new players like the hyperscalers, um, you know, folks that are truly investing or have invested in this area more for the consumer side, right? Now coming into being able to apply that into the um, communications and, and network space. So, so I think fundamentally, there, there's the aspect of it, even engineering culture is very different, right? The, the agility of developing software in the IT world, it's not something that, you know, folks who have been writing DSP code for physical layer, it's, it's just not something that uh, has traditionally been been part of that um, kind of group, group. So so I would say that there's some aspects of that. And and ultimately also, I do want to throw in the the complexities of interoperability, right? I think, I mean, we, we it's, it's a nice goal to have vendor A work with vendor B, it's of course, you know, Orange Alliance working hard on defining these interfaces. At the end of the day, the proof in the pudding is I put them together, they work and they work well and they actually work at performance. So, so I, companies like, like, like Viavi and, and Keysight Palaji here, I mean, our, our role really is to make sure that interoperability works, you know, pretty much from day one or, or at least with, 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 with least rework needed. And I think these engineering challenges cannot really be trivialized because it's just not the way operators tended to work before, right? Uh, and these are things that, you know, really this, this industry needs to kind of build these new muscles around. Yeah, and I think to, to add to that, you know, it's back to the, the enthusiasm and the excitement that is now coming back into the industry. And I think, you know, to the point that, you know, we were talking earlier about the numbers of companies now that are ready to engage in the open round ecosystem. Suddenly, I've got billions of dollars of R&D investment to solve these technical problems um, and bring out new features and solutions um, than you know pre than previously. You know, if you look, if you compare, you know, three incumbents, you know, three-year roadmaps to bring products through, and then suddenly I've got a cloud-native uh, virtualized system on the other side, where in fact actually the operator can actually write his own apps and compete directly with other operators with his own innovation. He doesn't have to wait for um, a silicon provider or, or, or a vendor to turn those ideas into a product for his network. So I think, I think we're right at the beginning of a huge disruption that's gonna take place in the mobile infrastructure market. And, and yeah, you, you know, they, 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 there are challenges around interoperability, but those challenges will get solved. You know, that's the great thing about, you know, the engineering community. We all love a challenge, we all love solving it. 
and finding a better way to do it. And, and I think, you know, what we're seeing is right up front with all this debate about, you know, security, you know, whether it's better to do it with an X86 or whether it's better to use an ASIC, you know, there are pros and cons for everything. But, you know, every time somebody says, oh, it's hard, then, you know, a group of people jump up and say, yeah, that's great. I'm, I'm going to solve that problem. So, um, and, and, and that's what you need is the ability for people to get up and solve a problem and, 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 and really put that enthusiasm into solving some of the problems that, you know, are going to be there in terms of defining use cases and scenarios around 6G and, and how to, and, and bottom line, how do, how do operators make money and consumers get what they need from a mobile service? They're the two issues that really need to be focused on, not whether we've got the best technology necessarily to go do this. It's, it's about, you know, operators making money, consumers getting excited about the fact that they've got the latest, you know, bandwidth, if you like, into their house and with the latest apps, et cetera, et cetera, and, and, the, and the ability to use the latest tools on it. So, um, you know, I think, I, th I think the time is right for this disruption in the industry and uh, a new generation of uh, engineers, if you like, to get their arms around it. I, I think so, the, the integration challenge is, is, is real. I think you talked about it well there, John, but the, and the other thing to bring up is make, to make sure that we, we focus as, as an industry to making sure that we have a secure solution. And so there's a lot of work going on right now in the ORAN Alliance and the security focus group to make sure that the minimum baseline required for, for Open RAN is, is one that's appropriate. So we don't want interfaces using passwords and things. We want certificate based. We want mutual authentication. All those kind of things need to be there. So we really have a solid foundation because when you do all these integrations, we need to have a minimum security baseline that everyone, all the different parties you know, work to, to make sure that's there. And then some of these are foundational things for zero touch architectures as well. So I would bring security into the, into the mix then some great work going on in the security focus group right now. In but, but without, without diving down a slippery slope, you know, security is a day-to-day -day issue in the industry and you, you you know, we have teams focused to that every day. So, you know, it's not a negative. It's just, a day, again, it's a day-to-day -day issue as the industry moves on, as new technology comes into place. You know, we have, we have security issues to solve. You know, we have supply chain issues to solve. They get solved, we move on, and we take advantage of it. it you know, it's not a barrier to entry. Um, if I can make one uh, point, uh, slightly tangential, you know, uh, this is with respect to the question of zero touch and the ease of deployment. Um, one, you know, uh, one thing is there are a large number of different deployment models and some of them, for example, like the small enterprises, like private networks, um, value the ease of deployment over a lot of other things, right? Of course they need performance, but in the end, we, the, they also need, uh, they are used to having sort of and their IT department um, you know, hang up a few Wi-Fi access points and just have them work, right? They are thinking about providing network coverage with that kind of a mindset. And we may, you know, from the cellular world, from, from, from this world, we are used to thinking of it as big infrastructure that needs a lot of effort to configure and deploy. And we need to bridge that gap in order to uh, be able to provide service to all of these use cases, including those kinds of use cases. Great, thanks Balaji. So Ant, I wanna pick up on John's comments about getting smart people in the room to figure out a solution. Can you talk a little bit about the role of specifications and technical standards and how this and how it plays um, into shape the traditional networks that we see today? And I also would like to pull in a question from the audience about the intersection of 3GBP and ORAN in the evolution path of 6G. Yeah, that's that's great. So so yeah, my you know my, myself you know and, and my team you know we're, we're involved in both 3GBP and ORAN and Next Line. So definitely specifications, as you know, are a key part to this ecosystem, right? Without specs, then nothing interworks. Your cell phone won't be able to connect to the network, right? So so specs are are key. Uh, 3GBP obviously has been a key part, uh, really, really the main spec body for the cellular industry for for a long time, and 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 that's kind of where it starts, right? That's where the air interface is, is specified, um, and in a way, kind of talking about 5G to 6G, 5G air interface is pretty much, you know, baseline is there. It won't change for 5G anymore, and so that kind of you know talks a little bit about like why we need 6G is sometimes you go back and see. Hmm, for these applications, we really need a fundamental change to how we did 
the baseline air interface. And that's really when we start talking about, we need to do 6G. Um, and, and usually that happens probably in about, you know, a two year time frame from now, there'll be a workshop in 3GPP that starts talking about what will 6G look like and eventually the specs will evolve from there. What's interesting development now is with ORAN Alliance is to John's point as well is ORAN Alliance came about because 3GPP uh, for some reason or another was unable to specify some interfaces that operators felt was really important. Talk about the open front hall, right? The radio and the baseband unit used to be based on CIPRI, not really a true open standard, um, you know, some aspects of openness. So open front hall, you know, started with the XRAN forum. That's really the impetus for uh, a big part of working group four now, of course, in ORAN Alliance. And that's kind of where it started. And it opened up, of course, the intelligence aspects, the RIC also based on open interfaces like E2 and A1 and the small, uh, the service management orchestration layer for the O1. So, so these, you know, in a way, 3GPP and ORAN are very complementary today because, you know, ORAN decided to put effort into specifying interfaces that, you know, 3GPP just uh, happens to either not prioritize or wasn't able to push through. I would say going into 6G with the, um, you know, with ORAN Alliance and 3GPP in full swing, um, my expectation is we will see some amount of convergence. 3GPP will start pulling in some of these aspects of those done in ORAN. You know, ORAN, for example, is also in, in, in progress with some things of, of course, you know, making all the standards much more open, um, you know, going through the uh, potentially the Etsy process as well. So, so we will see 3GPP and ORAN somehow converge, I think, in, in the 6G timeframe. And I think there's already a, a plan in 3GPP with release 19, 20, and 21 with study items, work items, and outputs that take you through to 2028, maybe. So 2024, 20, 26, 28 timeframe for these different releases that will do the kind of foundational heavy lifting in around 6G, but supplemented and augmented by by our own alliance. So I think what's important is that there's, there's no overlap and it's, it's, it's complementary, and also that there's no fragmentation of the standard on a global global basis. So I think that's important too. So global global standard, uh, no overlap in standards body, and a consistent approach. You, making sure that right, I mean right now, 3GPP has this sort of foundational layer, the air interface. What enables seven billion devices to work everywhere you go in the world is you know having that common air interface. So we don't want to break those compatibilities. Yeah, for the for the sake of being provocative, um, you, you know, I think you know the 3GPP process is broken. Um, and to that extent, um, you know, that's, that's why ORAN Alliance came into place. Now, you, you know, unless the 3GPP um, changes the philosophy to allow smaller companies, more companies to participate and, uh, you know, get involved in standards, we're going to see more and more offshoots like ORAN Alliance happening. Now, um, to one point, you know, we don't want to break the, the, the overall ecosystem and the global ecosystem for standards. but you know, the danger, you know, that I see going on at the moment is that actually this issue around contribution to standards has got so, um, if you like, political that, you know, every country is discussing in some way or other how to, you know, participate in the standards process because they see this, um, you know, vendor lock issue and the ability to, you know, grow their own economies with mobile suppliers as, as a big issue. Um, I think there's a model that, that takes place where, you know, you have a framework organization, maybe 3GPP, and then lots of, you know, coordinated standards bodies such as ORAN and Open Compute and all these guys, you know, taking a piece of it to fully specify it all brings together. But unless there's a commitment to produce standards with fully open and interoperable standards, we won't get to 6G. Um, and, I, and I think that's a pretty aggressive statement, but I, I, I truly believe the, the standards process is one of the things that everybody talking about 6G needs to look at right in the beginning and ensure that, you know, we don't lose the enthusiasm that really is coming out of the open RAM process and let it fall back into a, a, a scenario where it's controlled by three vendors. And that, that is not acceptable. And, um, you, you know, and I think the industry needs to get their arms around that fairly, fairly quickly. And I would, I would just point out that, I mean, 3GPP is the, is the most successful standards organization of all time, creating a, a global ecosystem of these 7 billion devices, successful from 3G to 5G. And it's a open uh, organization, open SDO, where one company, one vote, whatever company is a member gets the vote for that. And so that open and transparent 
approach to standardization seems appropriate. And so there is room for other standards organizations, of course, and they need, they need to be complementary. But the six, the 16,000 specification items that, that sort of 3GPP work on, I mean, that is a you know, huge amount of global heavy lifting on behalf of the, you know, the global ecosystem is, is a really important uh, contribution. And so it's, I think I would, I would respectfully disagree with that point of view. So um, just to make one more a point in the vein of being provocative, I, you know, uh, in open RAN, in ORAN, right? Um, ORAN, as, as Ian mentioned, has the history of starting from XRAN. And I would argue that uh, the, the core of ORAN really started as the front hall interface, which is, you know, with, between the DU and the RU. And the choice of that front hall interface is a historical fact, and it still exists now. Uh, but I would say going forward, there are cases, there is there is a case to be made that there are different kinds of front hall interfaces that may also work. And I would say that um, into when we move into 6G, that is something that we would have to revisit and make that a bit more open as well. Yep, yeah, totally agree. I, I you know, the, the, the reason I, I, I sort of focus down so hard on this activity you know, is the you know when you when you have a standards group that allows a small coalition of four companies to go off and write a proprietary specification that nobody else can use, which is part of a global standard, is is not a global standard. And um, you know, and I think we've seen all the fuss around, you know, with the Open RAN Alliance over the last few weeks. Well, some, somebody needs to go back and look at uh, you know the CIPRI coalition and others to, to to really get underneath this. But you know, the whole standards process needs to be carefully looked at and ensure companies, countries, and, and nations that want, want to aspire into becoming suppliers are allowed to, allowed to participate. And it should be a level playing field with open competition. Great. Yeah, I mean, it should be open. I mean, open and the structure we have with one company, one vote, I mean, I think is, is fair, but we'll, I guess we'll respectfully disagree on that point. Definitely. We have a bunch of great questions coming in. Um, Balaji, I'm hoping that you can help us with one on AI. I think that we've maybe answered part of this person's um, question already around complications on AI. So we'll get to the second part. Are there concerns about AI not being robust enough to automatically control a commercial network where AI might result in outages due to improper training and testing? Um, yeah, it's a, it's a great question. I mean, I mean first of all, um, yeah, I, th there is, uh, you know, a tendency to uh, have AI as a solution to everything these days, and 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 you know the the the, um, but that's clearly not the case. There are, um, you know, if if the problem is well defined, if the number of variables in the problem are controllable and very clear, then the solution a lot of times lies in. Uh, the, the traditional way of doing things that we've always done using communication theory and, and signal processing way of solving things. And I would suspect that those things would still uh, be true going forward. Uh, but uh, there are uh, you know, a large number of problems as we are you know, entering into these massively large networks uh, where uh, the, the scope of that problem uh, is simply not quantifiable into a finite number of, you know, as, as a finite variable problem, uh, or even that, that the, the real, um, uh, you know, uh, the, the input output equation is not really uh, well defined under those kind of conditions is where AI really flourishes and where it should be used and it should be used judiciously. I think that's one point I wanted to make. Uh, but Beyond that, um, you know, uh, the, the question is very legitimate, uh, I, at least in the initial stages, uh, whether, uh, you know, AI would somehow, you know, break things. Uh, and that is true uh, in general, uh, anywhere the, the AI ML techniques have been used. I mean, you could pose the same problem uh, where uh, the robotic helper who's supposed to help the old person would actually do harm to him, right? That's true there as well. And, and uh, so, uh, you know, I would say that um, the, the AI ML community themselves are, you know, very aware of this and they, they have a lot of different ways of, uh, you know, approaching this and guarding against it. 
uh, and and so I'm fairly confident that when we get to commercialization, uh, these kinds of issues will you know be ironed out. Uh, but the problem of testing uh, does exist, and that is something that you know companies like you know Keysight and a lot of others are putting a lot of thought into uh, in the space. Uh, you know, um, you know, the, uh, an AI-enabled network uh, may look from the outside like a traditional network, but there is something special going on. Um, you know, where things are not so well defined, uh, and, and and algorithms are being created on the fly, and and certain processes are happening on the fly. And how do you test for such a system? How do you test for corner cases? Uh, how do you test for the uh, whether the data set that you used for your initial training is actually compatible with the kind of data, st the statistical nature of the data that you are ultimately going to perform under in the live network. I think these are all really good, uh, you know, things to that we all need to think about as an industry. Uh, but but I'm, I'm these are the hard problems, like John and others said, that all of us engineers, you know, wake up and go to work for and. I'm confident that when we get to commercialization, you know, we will see uh, a fruition of all these efforts. Great, thanks Balaji. All right, everyone, we have three minutes left. So let's quickly go to a lightning round. In 30 seconds, what keeps you up at night as we look to 6G? John, do you wanna start off? I think getting the openness of interfaces out there and um, leveling the playing field for everybody to compete. Paul? I think it, it, making sure that we, we have a simple solution. So the, using the automation and AI that we're talking about, implementing that, so we generate the simplicity, which will enable the, the benefit of the infrastructure that we're building in 6G. So simplicity. Simplicity. Good. Ian, what keeps you up at night? Apart from my 18 month old, um, <laughs> I think ultimately it's, to me, it's, it's interoperability, right? At the end of the day, if that does not really come to fruition, all this uh, ORAN and openness is, is you know, this aggregation is not gonna happen. So we have to pay attention to interoperability. Blaji, take us home. What keeps you up at night? Um, for 6G, I would say that um, you know how do we how do we formulate the initial problem of 6G? I mean, uh, how do we bring together the key set of problems to solve and make sure they are the right ones that we are solving and that we are not expending a lot of effort initially on solving the wrong things? And uh, you know, um, I think I think that's that's what I would say in a, in a big sense when we move into a new generation of technologies, that's usually the biggest concern for me. So would you say that we're focusing on the right things right now? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely, yeah. It's great to hear. Well, 6G World, thank you so much for allowing this policy person to foster a provocative conversation with these engineers. Gentlemen, thank you so much for your time.